it's always lovely at the beginning of um, digital meetings when you see the sort of uh, faces and names pop up and uh, and you see who's who's joining us for, for a conversation. Loads of uh, great friends of, of the Scotland Malawi partnership, both in Scotland and uh, Malawi. So uh, a hearty good morning to those in Scotland and uh, good afternoon, uh, if my math is right, for those in Malawi. I, I think I probably know almost everyone here, um, but in case not, uh, my name is David Hope Jones and the Chief Executive of the Scotland Malawi Partnership. And I'll be chairing the next 60 minutes or so our informal discussion on power in partnerships, who holds it. Um, this is the, the, the first in a series of three, what we're calling our, our summer, summer sessions, and, and maybe just a, a very brief word on, on the sort of context for them. I suppose, firstly, for us, it's a, it's a recognition that the, the summer months are slightly different. You know, people uh, aren't so uh, available. You're navigating scheduling uh, around holidays, et cetera. But also, uh, really in response to a, a bit of feedback we've had from a number of members um, saying how much they really value, particularly historically, the, the more in-person events, those informal and accidental and organic conversations that happen, the sort of, you know, what, what we in, in the UK would call the sort of water cooler moments, those those people you just happen to be sitting next to and, and, and happen to have a conversation and happen to, to really benefit from and often in the bilateral relationship, it's it's the people uh, you find yourself uh, next to on a on a plane where some of those most interesting conversations uh, come from. So we just wanted to trial something different, uh, a far less formal uh, sort of event, potentially fewer people, more more discursive um, around key themes um, of the day. And to decide those themes, we had a quick vote in in the bulletin. Thanks if if you were one of the many members who voted, and we came up with three. Uh, themes that, that I hope through that process are, are really of, of relevant to, 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 to members and, and partners. The first, uh, and that's what we're focusing on today, is about power in partnerships, who holds it. The second uh, is sustainability, easy to say, hard to achieve, that'll be in July. And our third in the series is digital inclusivity. Is there equitable access to the digital new world? And that will happen in August. I'll share the dates at the end of this conversation. As I say, there's no there's no agenda. I'll, I'll introduce things for a couple of minutes, if, if I may. Um, but beyond that, I'm really relying on pe people putting up their, their digital hands and, and sharing their, their their views. I have in, in, in all, uh, you know, full transparency approached, uh, you know, a handful of, of, of people that I've had previous conversations on this and really encouraged them to, co uh, to come and uh, attend and, and share. And that's not in any way giving undue weight or, or preferential treatment to, to, to those views, but I suppose it's just that theory of, of getting the snowball rolling. Sometimes when you start discussions like this, you, ne you need a few people to, to start and then others uh, come in and, and, and join in. Um, I, I don't think it needs saying, but uh, you know, it, it's all about respectful uh, exchange and, and open dialogue, um, you know, as I'm sure you'd expect, I would challenge anything that falls, uh, you know, really short of, of what we see as the, the core values of, of the Scotland Malawi partnership as a network, but really it's it's all about listening to different and diverse views, and it's not about policing language, so a, a low appetite all round for, for people uh, uh, looking to be offended at other people's language, and, and really um, uh, it's, it's all about looking to listen to different views and potentially views you might disagree with and having uh, a really open uh, and, and, and constructive conversation. But as I say, you know, knowing our members and, and looking at uh, the excellent members we have uh, with us today, I have absolutely every confidence that it will be a really useful exchange. Um, to, to help, I suppose, steer what we wanted to talk on in uh, the email uh, you received before the event, we gave uh, half a dozen questions and in a moment I'm going to read those questions out. And there's various ways we could do this and, and we might change through the series, but my suggestion is rather than sort of being too dogmatic about right question one and only seeking views on question one, you know, recognising that people, you know, know what they want to say on this theme of power in partnerships, and recognizing that, that you know a comment or an input may want to respond to someone else's or cover a number of those questions. I, I'm not going to go through them in order, but rather just read them out in a moment and then really just throw it open for people to put up their hands digitally and, and say whatever they want on, on this question of power in partnerships. And if it begins to dry up, then I might be more proactive in saying on this specific question, any, any views, or if I feel that we've covered a a specific area in great detail and it'd be good to to get a bit of breath again I, I might come back 
with some specific questions. If I'm really mean, I might even uh, pick on pick on individual people to come back on, on specific questions. Um, on practicalities, um, you can put up your, your digital hand uh, at any moment. If that's not working or you can't find it, I think it's in the reactions button at the bottom of the screen, uh, put your video on and, and, and give me a, a wave. I'll, I'll keep it on gallery view. Um, uh, or, or just put your comment in the chat box or say, I want to speak, David, in the, in the chat box. So loads of different ways of putting up your hand and taking part in the discussion. If you're able to, and I appreciate some in Malawi may not be able to, but if you're able to while you're speaking, it'd be lovely to have your, your video on. Um, but no worries at all if that's not possible or not something you wish to do. As you will have seen and, and clicked a button to agree to, the, the meeting is being recorded and really exactly the same as all of our other SMP events. Um, we will put a full recording of the event on the uh, on the website. Uh, if, if you really want to make a point, but you don't want it to be recorded, uh, you can preface your point by saying, please don't you know please stop the recording for this specific comment um the recording button won't be turned off um for practical reasons but we will look to edit out that segment but my encouragement is if you're happy to um for us to have a, a full record of the meeting final point I, I want to make on practicalities before I, I read out those those questions and we get started is um uh, we, we want to do a piece of, of work um in the coming months that that looks to find better ways of using our website to help people tap into the nuggets of expertise in our in our uh, membership. So my, my sort of vision is that you could go onto a website and say, you know, click, you know, sustainability and school partnerships, and up would pop uh, five or six little nuggets of, of 60 seconds worth of, uh, of expertise from, from a member or partner in, in Malawi with different views that would not look to give the answer, but share different experience. So I really hope that from these summer sessions, we're able to pull out some of these little nuggets of expertise. But my absolute uh, assurance here is if we want to use something that anyone says for any purpose other than just the full recording of this meeting, we will contact you and seek your permission. So you're not going to pop up in all sorts of other places unless you've explicitly agreed to. So all encouragement to speak openly. Um, I think that's everything I, I wanted to say. Colleagues, uh, do jump in if there's anything I've forgotten. But what, what I'll do now is I'll read out this list of eight questions um, that sort of together frame where we want to take these discussions over the next um, 55 minutes or so. But please, while I'm doing so, um, put up your, your digital hand if you want to get started or, or put a comment in, in the chat box. Uh, and I really hope uh, by the time I've got to the end of these uh, six or seven questions uh, that there is some, some virtual uh, or digital hands up. So those questions were, who holds the power in your partnership? How does power find expression or, or are there different types of power in your partnership? Is it appropriate to use power to fight social justice? Is it is a focus on power the right approach to support equality or are there risks about any dialogue uh, driven by the sense of, of power? How have you taken uh, uh, have you taken active steps to recognize and address power imbalances and has this worked? Have your views on power in partnership changed over, over time? What advice would you give yourself uh, relating to power if you were starting your, your partnership afresh? And what more, uh, and our encouragement is really tangible things, could we as individuals and we as a community, the Scotland Malawi Partnership, to challenge and change power imbalances? Um, so that's everything by way of introductory re remarks um, and uh, just throwing it open for anyone that is brave enough to go first. And I, I owe Kevin Simpson a beer because he's the first digital hand up. Uh, other drinks are available. Uh, Kevin, over to, over to you. Uh, beer's fine. Um, just by, uh, by way of background, I'm with Malawi Fruits. Um, we work in the northern region with, uh, with farmers um, and there's 26 of us. We have 26 staff members, that's 25 Malawians plus me. So that gives you a, a picture of what's going on. And uh, just about the, I just want to say something about the way power has changed for us uh, through the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, I was traveling to Malawi three times per year. Uh, when I was there, I was there to support staff, to provide training. Um, we would make plans together, I thought. Um, and, uh, and then we, we had the pandemic and for two years I wasn't able to travel and all support had to be done uh, remotely. And what I found 
over that time was that I was increasingly in my weekly conversations with Atusai, who's our development executive uh, based in Mizuzu. Um, in those weekly conversations, I would find myself increasingly saying, well, Atusai, I'm not there, you're there, you're going to have to make the decision on this. And that was a real change because what had been happening in the past was that decisions were waiting until I was in the country, then we would talk about it together and we would make a decision. Um, so that has led, you know, it's, it's been almost entirely a good thing. Our staff are much more empowered, much more confident about making their own decisions. Um, I say almost entirely a good thing because they don't always make the decisions I would like. And sometimes they make some decision, you're like, what? What, you know, what, what did you do that for? Um, but it has been almost in, almost entirely a, a good thing. It has it has led to um, some other issues that I could say more about. But I'll stop there. And uh, yeah, okay, Kevin, that's that's really 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 helpful. Thanks so much. And I think that the, 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 you know one of the many nuggets there that sense of decisions that I don't agree with, and and maybe that's maybe that's the measure of success in this space. I, I don't know, but brilliant. And we'll maybe come back to some of those challenges later on. But really pleased to see uh, another hand or two hands up from uh, Tracy and Kundwani. Uh, friends, over to you. Yeah, all right. Uh, thanks very much for uh, recognizing us. So I'm Kundwani Chidzewi Sano from the Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences. And I'm with Tracy Mose here. Uh, we have been working together as partners in the uh, research, various research projects. And the, I'll, I'll talk about the partnership from the higher education uh, perspective. Uh, mostly uh, when we, we collaborate the, 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 the Global North and the Global South on research projects, uh, I should say that the, uh, in trying to respond to the question of who, who holds the power, uh, I can say we always try to strike a balance uh, between the two institutions, but uh, <clears throat> you will see that uh, sometimes the, the, the balance is disturbed because uh, of uh, the, the funding is institutions in this case. Uh, I, uh, I can specifically say that most of the research projects that we do are funded by institutions uh, in the global north and not in the global south. So because of that, the one who holds the press will always have, will always have the power to a certain extent. But uh, uh, as institutions, for example, Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences and the University of Strathclyde, we have tried to, to level uh, the, 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 the field itself to make sure that there's a balance. Uh, I, I can give an example of a situation whereby we are applying for research grants. We will always have the same level. We may all be like co-investigators in the research projects, but also uh, when we are publishing articles in, in the journals, uh, well, anyone can be can be the first author, or anyone can be uh, the last author, depending on how much you have contributed uh, to this particular publication. So, in that way, it's a way of just making sure that there is really a level field between partners in the global north and partners in the global south. And I should say that uh, when Tracy left Malawi some two three years ago, uh, I should say that uh, we have continued working together in this collaboration. And the, there's, the, uh, that's, there's this really a way of trying to strike a balance between the two. We look at, at this kind of partnership as the equal between uh, we from Mubaz and our colleagues uh, from the University of Strathclyde. But mostly, there's always, we always try to strike a balance between the two. The only problem comes in by the funding institutions they come with their own, like the Medical Research Council, for example, they come with their own conditions and they, con they want to control the funding and that always disturbs the balance that is there between uh, academic institutions in terms of research. But maybe my colleague can add more on the, uh, what I have said in terms of uh, the power between uh, implementing research at the community level. Tracy, want to say something? Yeah, I, well, I don't want to. I don't want to hog the, <laughs> the um, microphone when there's lots of other people in the room. I guess Kondwani and I were chatting about this before we started. I should say Edgar's asking if I'm back in Malawi. No, Kondwani's sitting in what is not very nice Scottish summer, because um, he's here for his PhD graduation yeah. tomorrow. Yay! <laughs> um, so um, we're hoping that the sun will shine tomorrow for that purpose, at least. Um, 
So I think we had this kind of idea when we we're talking about it, there were two levels of our work, I guess. One where we've got the higher education to higher education links, but also the work that we do directly with communities as well. And we were just reflecting back on how that relationship has been with communities since we started out. And, and when we started with a lot of the work that we did um, in Chikwawa, for example, you know, we did research, we knew what people needed, right? We had the solutions. Come on, guys, step up and meet us halfway. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course you want toilets and of course you want all these things. And why aren't they being sustained and, and all these kind of things. And within a very short period, we really changed the way that we work with communities because I think that's part of the problem is that partnership with communities as well um, is, you know, often assuming that we knew what was better, what the communities needed, but without taking time to understand what the community's priorities and needs were. And our way of working now in terms of developing these research proposals or when we do develop research proposals with colleagues, we build in really significant periods of time where we can do a lot of formative work, which involves listening to the voice of communities, understanding where priorities leave. Obviously, we work in environmental health primarily and um, but of course I could argue that you know everything is a determinant of health at the end of the day and um, so by having um you know having that understanding of where community priorities lie and not just the the priorities of leadership within the communities but the priorities of those marginalized and unheard voices in communities as well I think we've made a much more significant impact and difference in the work that we've done jointly um, in those areas and, and and that's kind of evident as well in the, in the way that it's been taken up and, and expanded elsewhere as well so I think I'll stop there we, I think we've monopolized the microphone for long enough for now thanks yeah. no 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 monopoly at all we're just getting started thanks so much Kundwani thanks Tracy uh, as well and it's that humility and self-awareness to be able to to look back and say wow how we did that 10 or 20 years ago you know there's you know things have changed and again that's that's so so useful so thanks so much for that um perhaps if we could have uh, edgar next and then uh, michael yeah thank you very much and um i think kevin did a fantastic job of demonstrating how COVID has shifted the power play in the past two years uh, that's a very good example uh, I am Edgar, uh, and I'm currently director for Community Energy Malawi. And um, as many of you are aware, Community Energy Malawi uh, was formed out of great work that was done by Scottish partners in Malawi. And I think it was one way of handing over the stick to Malawi and sort of like take lead by initiating their own renewable energy uh, technologies that uh, would help communities. Um, I think we currently have long-standing partnerships with Community Energy Scotland and Invest of Strathclyde, among others. And previously, I think these two colleagues or these two partners were used to, you know, take, take the leading role uh, in everything because uh, they were working in Malawi. Uh, they are the ones who knew the doors. And then uh, when Community Energy Malawi came into being, uh, the power play has in, uh, in many ways shifted. I would call myself as a clear demonstration of the power of partnerships because uh, I was trained as an agriculturist myself, but I've now transitioned into an energy expert and all this is cadets of the capacity building, mentorship and support for my, my Scottish partners. I would cite, for example, Nicholas Gabbins as one who has mentored me very much on strategic leadership, team building and social enterprises. And then Devin Frame from University of uh, Strathclyde did a fantastic job in grooming me uh, in technical aspects of market assessment, system design and business modeling. Uh, so much so that uh, previously I used to approach uh, uh, projects, enrollment and implementation from the usual enrollment aid perspective. Uh, but now I think uh, I lead my team in co-creating uh, innovative energy projects that are built on solid business models uh, deployed and operated by social enterprises, leading to great results and impact in the communities, creating jobs, catalyzing new businesses, and of course, achieving a greater sense of sustainability. Probably that explains why we are now the successful operators of the solar 80 kilowatt mini grid and in Nagata, the solar uh, powered energy hubs, which have in turn end us uh, the Ashton International Award shortlist. So you would see that at the end of the day, we've benefited more and we are now taking lead. Currently, we are working on a very big project uh, to scale up our mini grid. And guess what? It is me leading the, the park with Damien and, the, and, the, and, the, and Nicholas Gabbins, for example supporting 
they are like the remote guys who are just keeping checking things but uh, everything else it is me and my team doing the feasibility studies uh developing the impact reports uh, the feasibility reports developing the business cases to me i feel like this is a very clear demonstration of how power should be we should be able to empower others uh, able to uh, share our knowledge and then open up the doors so that others can take lead today we are talking about should in our work because we are committed energy general we're taking the lead so um all in all in terms of who holds power i think usually power is held by those that are well knowledgeable and by transferring knowledge you also empower the people you also empower the others and then they also um, have a power uh, is it appropriate really to support social justice using power it's very important uh, energy access energy poverty is a very great issue if we had left it to the people of scotland to be taking lead in all these things uh, i think we wouldn't have had the direct uh, projects that we have now as community energy Malawi, things that we were able to initiate on our own but it's because they shifted the power play uh, they used the uh, uh, mentorship uh, they used the grooming and all that to sort of like give us the confidence we are able now to do all these things and of course any advice that i would give myself is uh, definitely if I have another opportunity to partner with Kevin, I would definitely tap into his knowledge on how to bring mango, uh, Maui fruits into our energy projects so that at the end of the day, I see something happening. This is how things should be. Thank you. Edgar, thanks so much. What brilliant testimony. And I think one of the main things I heard there uh, is that sense of it doesn't happen by accident. You know, that there was, you know, structures that were established uh, and that there was a purposeful and planned investment in expertise and knowledge and capacity, and that that has demonstrably increased impact and effectiveness on the ground. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Edgar. That's absolutely super. Um, let me turn to Mike Beresford next. Mike, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I, I'm the mission director for Zambezi Mission, which was founded back in 1892 by Joseph Booth, who worked alongside John Chilembwe uh, and uh, Joseph Booth wrote this paper Africa for the African so that's our idea of um, of mission is working with local churches local church partners um, and we try to do this in a mutual way uh, you know as Christians we believe everyone uh, is you know we have this sort of mutuality we're all responsible to each other we're all equal and we all need each other and for, for a lot of churches in the UK, this idea of interdependence, we kind of think, oh, how can we give to help uh, the poor people in Malawi? But actually, we rich people in inverted commas need to really learn from our Malawian brothers and sisters. So we try to sort of work out how we can work in an interdependent way, which um, is easier said than done. So we kind of think, we, we try to say there's no power, but I think we are looking from a position of power privilege. So it's very hard for us to sort of understand, is it really mutual? Is it really inter interdependent? But that's always our aim. Um, what I feel has, you know, in, in the current climate of trying to be more mutual, to take all power out. The thing that we've found very difficult in recent years is, and we're, we're based both in England, Wales and Scotland. So our main sort of uh, duty is to the Charity Commission. And it's their um, sort of recent uh, moves on safeguarding following the Oxfam um, incident, their, their moves on safeguarding say, if you work overseas, you have to apply the same practices in uh, overseas as you do in England and Wales and if you work with partners they have to have appropriate safeguarding procedures in place and so they just said those as two statements and um, you know they, they've set the bar way up there compared to uh, how we would have worked perhaps in the past and we found that a particularly challenging thing and the Charity Commission are very risk averse they basically handed all the responsibility back to the charities. And um, we found it particularly hard when you think about what is a, 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 a significant incident or a serious incident 
from the Charity Commission's point of view, it is an incident that could affect your own reputation as a charity, but also the reputation of Charities UK, as it were. And you're left with the responsibility of deciding how to manage your uh, partners, when I say manage, how to work with them. So we've had all this mutuality and this move towards interdependence. And then all of a sudden you have to say to your um, partners, we'll only work with you if you comply with what we say is necessary. We found that particularly challenging. So um, that, that's our big sort of uh, like uh, a, a flow against the direction we've been traveling in. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. There's 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 lots there to unpack and get into. You know, I particularly like that statement of you know it's hard to see a power dynamic when you're in it. Uh, I think that's really really useful. And how do you manage your domestic serious domestic legal responsibilities on compliance while maintaining equitable partnership? Just quick point to note: Charity Commission south of the border, Oscar north of the border, but. It, basically exactly the same most viable events I'm, I'm really you know i'm encouraging other people to, to to share openly with humility and probably only fair that i do the same so i'm going to jump in here with two related quick bits of sharing i, I hadn't planned to, to, to say this at all but i think link usefully from 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 mike and then uh, i can see jonathan you've got your hands up i'll turn to you next but again in, in that spirit of openness and, and sharing yeah i completely agree i mean if, for us the scotland malawi partnership as you all know we've got our sister network that hugely inspiring malawi scotland partnership and a really difficult phase for us was between 2005 and 2012 when the SNP had core funding and MASP didn't completely understandably with no money for a secretariat there wasn't the same activity in Malawi and it was just outrageous that anyone would expect that Malawi would be doing it without any money when SNP required money to, to, to do it so we made you know again and again and again funding applications for, for MASP and I was routinely told that, that you know neither of the two governments involved would, would fund MASP but in the end it, it did and it's absolutely brilliant uh, and, and you know everyone can see exactly what uh, Edgar was seeing, saying about that sort of once you've created those structures and invested then it all takes off but it's not going to happen before then but one of the, the hard things for us was between 2012 and 2020 for completely understandable reasons no no criticism here of the Scottish government the only way the Scottish government could fund uh, MASP was through the SNP and that was just for a, a legal point that they needed a legal entity in the UK so we were receiving those funds uh, uh, for MASP to deliver it and suddenly I could see that a challenge that all of our members often have that I hadn't really appreciated before that you know I am the project manager of MASP now that is a legal fact in the UK but completely undermines the entire purpose of what we're looking to achieve. MASP is essentially reporting to me, and then I report to the Scottish Government for completely understandable reasons. Um, and that was really hard, and that required really active management of that to try and make it practically possible. Obviously, you know, it was still better than MASP not having funding, uh, but it was really difficult. And, and, and I suppose that's something that a lot of our members have because often the, the legal person, you know, the legal persons is, is, is the, the UK based, the Scottish based entity. I said there was two things I was going to share. I'm going to save the, the, the second back possibly for later on if it's, if it's relevant because I really want to listen to members. I'm going to turn to Jonathan uh, first and then Gary. Jonathan, over to, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, I'd just like to build a little bit on, on what Mike was, was just saying. Um, I'm the director of the Caruso Trust, um, which is a, a, a Christian uh, mission charity uh, that works by partnership with uh, a, a separate and independent uh, Malawian uh, ministry organisation called J-Life Ministries uh, as, our, as our main partner anyway. Uh, and so what we have here is, is, a, is, is two separate governance structures. You know, we've got a, a board in the, in, of the Caruso Trust in, in the UK um, and a board of J-Life uh, in, in Malawi. So I think the first thing to say here is in our experience working with this kind of structure is, is the importance of communication because uh, we've then got you know, the operational side of the Crusoe Trust and the operational side of J-Life under separate, um, separate independent boards, one, one 
one in the UK, one in one in Malawi. And and that makes a very equal mutual kind of structure. But at the same time, it, it also has to be has to be navigated through. Uh, so, for example, with setting up budgets at the beginning of the year, because the money is flowing from our side and, and we mustn't run away from the fact that, that money is power <laughs> and it's power that we have to then handle very carefully and uh, and and seek not to wield. Um, but then when we set up budgets, there may be plans on the Malawi side and plans on the UK side, and we have to bring those together um, so that we are actually singing from the same song sheet and, and trying to do that in a mutual way can be, can be quite delicate. Building on what Mike said about the issue then of, of um, particularly like safeguarding, but also just financial management, uh, as a UK charity, we're registered both in Scotland and in, and, and in England with the Charity Commission. We very much recognise that we are people as a board who are under authority. We're under the authority of, of these, these, these national bodies and we're under particularly under authority in the way we do safeguarding, where we do financial management. Um, and something I find that is that is that that, uh, that concept that we are under authority ourselves is something that at the Malawi side can be quite hard to understand. There is, there's often that perception, you know, we have the money and, and we have to just decide to give it. And, and then the work can be done and there will be a conversation as to what that money is spent on. So, for most of what we are doing with with our funds we can work in this we are two two organizations and we agree together what the the program of activities for the year will be and agree the budget and, and we will fundraise it and make that available but then you get safeguarding where suddenly this mutuality of relationship sort of has to be set aside almost uh, and we have to say but in order for us to be able to give you money, we have we have to demand almost that you undertake these activities with safeguarding and that you handle money in these particular ways. But to try and explain that that is because we are people who are under authority. It's not just us suddenly being colonialists in in this area where in all other areas of our work we are very carefully trying not to be colonialists but that we are people under authority and 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 i find that that malawi side a number of people i've met with find this very hard to understand um so we just keep having to sort of explain it again and again um and but it does work very much against all our partnership principles of mutuality that there are suddenly then these boxed areas where suddenly we have to say this is a condition or you cannot receive our funding um, and that it's somebody else telling us that we have to work this way. Jonathan thanks ever, ever so much and yeah ab absolutely getting those getting the balance between genuine equality of partnership and managing very fixed, robust, unwavering expectations of, of funders, potentially quite reasonably, uh, uh, and those external responsibilities, I think it's really important. Uh, Susan, and, and good for her, has given a healthy challenge in, in the chat box, and it's a, it's, it's a challenge with, with regards diversity and representation, specifically uh, our, our speakers in terms of, of gender. Good for, good for you, Susan, thanks ever so much. Um, so yeah, we're really keen to listen to a good balance of voices from Scotland and Malawi, a good balances of voices um, from uh, uh, male and female voices and good balance across big and, and small organisations. So please, um, please be, 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 be brave. But I'm, I'm going to turn uh, and put up your, your hand to, to feed in. I'm going to turn to uh, Josephine next and then Gary, if that's OK. Josephine, uh, over to you. I was actually thinking we could invite Susan to go first. No, 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 you go. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, jo Josephine, Susan, then, then, then Gary. We'll get to you, Gary. Okay. Um, but let's, let's go in that order. Josephine, over to you. Thank you. All right. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone, or rather good morning in Scotland, since it's not 12 o'clock yet. Um, I'm Josephine Bango. I am a program partner support officer with Mary's Meals, currently based in Malawi, but working for Mary's Meals International in Scotland. And I just wanted to give a brief comment on the understanding around power versus partnerships. And sometimes I think we feel like, you know, part, the power itself yields, yields everything within a partnership. Um, but most recently, I think the views of the partnership principles that the Scotland Malawi partnership has um, between the two nations, Scotland and Malawi, they end up becoming the equalizer of power when you think about it. Um, and I feel like if we were to put in a code, we would say that the partnership principles are the equalizer of power within our relationship. And I believe that applying that from the larger scale between the relationship we have between our two nations and bringing that into, into our own partnerships on a one-to-one -one basis becomes a good equalizer of how we can relate together. Um, within any partnership. So I don't know if I'm going around in circles, but <laughs> I hope that makes a bit of sense. Yeah. Perfect sense. Absolutely. No, it's really useful. And I was just uh, getting there, the, the URL, so I've put them in there. Uh, for the partnership principles. And it's a really, really useful point because it, it, it gets us back to that practical thing. What can we actually do in this space? What does good look like? You know, it's good to appreciate the complexities and the challenges, but what does good look like and what can we do? That's really, really useful, Josephine. So for anyone who doesn't know, um, partnership principles, 10, 10 years old this year, they came from listening to 200 Malawian organizations, then 200 Scottish organizations. We've got these 11 principles. Hopefully they're quite snappy and easy to use. They, they're not dogmatic advice. They're not thou shalt not but rather it's questions questions like where is the power really value views on the partnership principles have they have they reached their sell by date are they still relevant what should we be uh, changing just a very quick recap for anyone that's joined since we've started this is an open space discussion really encourage everyone to put up their 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 hand and share their views on the question of power in partnership um susan if you are uh, entirely up to you if you if you would like to, to i know that's not what you were saying in, in your in your comment but if you'd like to susan open uh, open space Yes, I, I would like to come in. Uh, we'll save the patriarchy lecture for another time. Uh, I think whenever we enter into any partnership between Malawi, Scotland, the North, the South, rich country, poor country, I think we have to be absolutely honest from our end uh, that we actually, there is an imbalance of power. There's an imbalance of power of resources. Uh, there's an imbalance of power of information. I'll never forget uh, in, a, in a training session in uh, Addis Ababa with some women MPs from the Ethiopian parliament. And I was using a recent research report from, the U from UN Women on domestic violence in Ethiopia and the scale of it. And none of the women MPs had seen this report. It had not been shared with them. They had no idea about it. So they were unable, uh, they were quite angry, right? <laughs> but they were unable as parliamentarians to do their job properly because information was not, the imbalance power, uh, they didn't have the information they needed to do their job. And over the years, I've worked with politicians in Malawi and they do not have access to the information, uh, all sorts of information and resources that they need to do their job properly. But but even but but not focusing particularly on, on governance. Well, I suppose it's all governance, but just the, what I've learned over the last 15 years is that honesty and being open is the most important thing and understanding it took me several years because I've always considered myself um, uh, progressive on the left. Uh, I'm not part of the elite, uh, uh, which 
when you're in Malawi, the mere fact that you're white and uh, and you have two debit and three credit cards in your back pocket, of course you're part of the elite. Um, so I had to learn slowly and sometimes with difficulty over the years and how to build relationships that were as equal as they could be. And they're built on mutual respect. Uh, you may hold the money, but uh, your Malawi partner and colleague holds all the information, the, the, the cultural understanding, and also the ownership of it's her country and you're a guest there and you may come with, with, with money and full of ideas of how you can help. But at the end of the day, it, it, it is your, your partner's uh, future that you are taking part in. So I think honesty is, and, and recognize that we do, we are, we are the elite when we go to Malawi. And also understand that in Malawi, there is an elite as well. And that's what I was struck by what Tracy said about communities, because there is a tendency by uh, middle-class uh, Malawians and definitely by people working in development to assume that people in villages are A, not very well educated and B, they need another classroom block when in fact, actually what they might need is the borehole fixed or, you know, toilets for girls instead of another classroom block. So the, 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 and the assumption that just because you left school uh, at the end of primary school, that you're not particularly well educated, that's not, that's not the case. So I th honesty, I think, is, 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 is key to trying to build balanced relationships. Susan, thanks. Thanks so much. Completely, completely agree. Honesty and self-awareness. And thanks again for, for your you know, humility and, and openness to share the journey that, that you've been on uh, in that regard. You know, probably none of us like to think of ourselves as, as, as the elites, um, but self-awareness actually is, is really important. I'm going to go to uh, Gary next and then Jer uh, uh, Jenny. Uh, Gary, you're, you're defending a criticism of the Scottish summer earlier on, but you're defending it with, well, it was sunny a moment ago, but it looks a bit windier. Gary, over to you. So, like this, this is Edinburgh now. So um, uh, this is Scottish sun. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I have maybe something like 10 years of a Malawi connection, which started with, the six or seven years working in Scotland for an NGO and the last three years working in Malawi on behalf of the Church of Scotland and I can totally agree with all those who've talked about kind of having to come to realize personally and in the way I had worked in organizations organizations I'd worked with power was there in a way that I hadn't ever given uh, time to think about um but then when I have stopped to think about it and heard the conversations uh, that I had, my background is, is communications. And I, I do often worry that sometimes we rush into these processes of changing language in order to rebalance power or sometimes changing processes to try and rebalance power. And it's really just not that straightforward. It, it's, not, it's not that easy. We have to spend... Um, time in, in conversation and um, so absolutely agree with those who are saying that, that money is one of the biggest influencers in, in in power but it's I'm always kind of shocked week by week in the ways that I see it is that like who sets what time of day the the meeting is held at how long does the meeting last how many participants are there from from both sides um just the practical cost of, of joining a meeting and the data cost in Malawi uh, that's a number 45 bus in the background that you might hear. Um, is there equity in travel? Um, you know, the ways that we are, the ways that I have learned about power um, and how I should be giving it up. Uh, my Malawian colleagues won't have the same experience of coming to Scotland and seeing where that power has come from. And, and so they don't have the same opportunity to, to claim it. To, Sometimes we talk about giving power and pushing power away when I think we're not giving opportunities in, uh, in allowing our partners to claim that power and, and make use of it um, for themselves. 
And so these conversations we had, and with this I'll finish, about safeguarding and the governance requirements, um, like I totally understand, I've seen both sides of, of that, but there, there is law in Malawi as well. There are, there are regulatory bodies in Malawi um, as well. So those same pressures kind of exist. Yes, we want to do it differently, but we, or we need to do it differently because of the resources or the legal structures that are there. But we actually have that shared will to spend the money well uh, and to, uh, to deal with uh, people in a way that protects them and keeps them safe. That, like, that is a shared value in most of the partnerships. Um, and there's a legal obligation to do that in Malawi in the same way that there's a legal obligation to do that in Scotland, but we may struggle in kind of finding an equal power balance on working that out. There, I'll stop. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Gary. Absolutely. There was a reference earlier on to what COVID has given us in terms of, you know, this is my interpretation of what was said, you know, just fewer trips. Uh, you know, Scott's going out to Malawi, perhaps there's more ownership in, in Malawi and a really good sort of counter argument there, you know, tempering that around actually da data costs. And that's something we'll explore in the third of these sessions. But yeah, that point around, um, you know, we, we, you know, the, the, the need for safeguarding compliance is, is not only felt in, 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 in Scotland, but in Malawi as well. Really well made. Jenny, if I could turn to you, Jenny Chinabu. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Firstly, congratulations, Kondwani, on your PhD. That's a huge achievement. So well done. Um, so I'm Jenny. I work for the Church of Scotland. I have been working um, with Africa for probably 20 years, something like that. Um, Malawi being one of the one of the countries. I actually did my master's uh, dissertation was looking at this very subject about uh, power in partnership. And I think this, and that was 2012, so 10 years ago, things, you know, do move on. But I guess from that and from my experience, what I would say is um, money is clearly a big issue. And that was the main finding in my, in my dissertation that, Wherever there was money, no matter how equal you thought the partnership, the money always skewed it. And I think that's just something that we need to name and recognise and and almost put out in front of our partnership, you know, talk about it. So in terms of some of the kind of practical things um, that you were saying, David, I think there's something about given our partnership time. So when I say time, I mean rest, uh, investing in relationship. And I know that's really, really difficult because we're all such busy people. Um, and Gary will be smiling at this because whenever I visit him in Malawi, my time is so cut short and I'm not doing what I'm preaching. But um, I think there's something about, particularly when we're working cross-culturally, about spending that time to understand the cultural context that we're working in. So whether that's me going to Malawi or a Malawian colleague coming to Scotland and understanding my culture and my expectations as well as me understanding their, their culture and expectations. I think we also need to be aware of the um, history that we come from and the structures of colonialism which have been in place um, and the general mistrust that can come from that just because we maybe have white skin or um, or we come with a certain accent or, or whatever. And I say that because over the years I have noticed huge change when I'm uh, speaking with colleagues as soon as they know that I'm married to a black African, the conversation changes completely. And there is a, a depth and a level which I probably wouldn't get to so quickly. I'm not saying you can't get to it, but I probably wouldn't get to it so quickly. And a lot of that can be about the colonial systems and structures which we have opposed on our brothers and sisters in whatever different parts of the world where the empire went. Um, and how those structures actually aren't fit for purpose, but we're not willing to sit and listen to what the structures are in their country. So in Malawi, for example, you could even look at um, the, the eldership and chieftains and court systems, etc., which run so differently to the way you know our courts run, but we've put our court processes in place there. Um, the other thing I'd say is there's something about humility, about us going in and not thinking that we know everything and wanting to learn um, and like genuinely wanting to learn. I 
probably found that slightly easier in the sense that I was female and I was 27 or 28 when I first started going to um, Africa in this job and every single partner I met asked me how I could have this job because I was such a little girl so that was a power balance on the other way but actually it was quite helpful because it meant that I could go in and be like well actually I've got a lot to learn and um, I think there can be in the other way in terms of power um, and Kondwani, oh no, no, it wasn't Kondwani, it was Edgar, I think, which touched on this, about knowledge. Knowledge is real power. And often, from my perspective, when working with partners across um, Africa, I, what I need is knowledge from them. And if, if they don't want to give me that knowledge, then I can be in a pretty sticky situation when I've got a report to write or, you know, or whatever. So there can be that that imbalance that way and again to counter that it's about relationship and it's about honesty and it's about openness and uh, and humility so um i'm kind of rambling but i would say this to summarize we have to recognize that there always is a power imbalance particularly when money is involved but we need to go in with humility and openness and put time into building relationships and understanding the current cultural context and the history which which um which impacts that. Fantastic. Jenny, thanks ever, ever so much. Um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant points there. And, and particularly, particularly that understanding the history side, side of things. And from a Malawian perspective, we hear a lot of that from the Scottish perspective, but really hearing from a Malawian perspective, but hearing what you say of actually how hard it is to get to that level of trust, to have that conversation well and interesting to hear your experience of actually your you know, marital status with uh, with someone from the continent of Africa actually, you know, brought that trust. Well, I've, David, I can tell you a story. This was with a Nigerian colleague. So um, a Nigerian colleague came into my office to see me with one of, he lives in Scotland, Elijah Obina, some of you may know him. Um, and he had a colleague visiting from Nigeria. And the colleague from Nigeria was very polite, very, you know, there was nothing wrong, but quite distant. And I had a picture of me and my husband and my children in my room. And he saw it and he said, oh, is that your husband? And Elijah said, yeah, yeah, Jenny's one of us. She's married to an African. And the whole conversation changed completely. And he just opened up in a way that just probably wouldn't have happened. So I'm not saying that everybody has to marry somebody from Africa, but <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that there is there's definitely I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it switch that there's a reserve a reservedness there because of people's past experience or assumptions or um, yeah experience. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for, for sharing that. I'm going to turn to uh, Chrissy. There was a tentative digital hand that went up and then and then down. Uh, I don't know if you if you want to speak and then and then to, to Kevin, then we're going to begin to, 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 to wrap it up. But if anyone has any practical recommendations, I know it's the hardest thing, you know, great point from Josephine about the partnership principles as a device. I hope that sharing these nuggets and thinking about how do we get across? I mean, we, we've got this I don't want to call anyone an expert. I try and never, never, never do that. But, you know, we've got that real experience and depth of experience, you know, in, in this conversation. I really want to find ways of sharing that with other people. But any recommendations, please do um, put them in the chat box or put up your, your hand for the final contributions. I'm going to go um, to uh, to Chrissy if, if you want to, Chrissy. And then Kevin, I'm not sure if it's a legacy hand, but if, if you're still up for it, uh, over to you, Kevin. Chrissy first. Uh, so I, I put my hand down because I saw we were nearing the bell. Um, but uh, and I, I we we were involved in this really really interesting learning progress process at Cora, um, or more or less over the last year. And so I've put links in the chat box if if uh, people are interested to have a look. Um, and it picks up on Jenny's point in a way <laughs> that uh, it's very hard to get away from the money. Um, and just being aware of that dynamic, I think, is enormously important. Um, but even acknowledging that dynamic, I think, well, you know, some of the key conclusions that we have is that there are a great deal that you can do in terms of structures and in terms of structuring relationships that can really help support equity and partnerships that that are then inevitably you know more more powerful and successful and sustainable partnerships um, so there's, there's lots of stuff on our website about that and i'd be very happy if anyone wants more details that they're, they're welcome to contact me more directly the point i wanted to make was um 
So in fact, from, from the Caucasus, not from Malawi, but just from my own experience from having um, worked in programs overseas. Um, and that, that I think it's worth having conversations with your team, with your partnership that are explicit about power, but also about the nuances and, and the different sort of, essentially the, the different power and influence that different people on the team can bring in a kind of collective toolkit, because I might have power and influence with a certain set of stakeholders in that context for that particular program, but then my different colleagues from different communities with different professional backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, they bring their power and influence with that range of stakeholders that our program is engaging with in different ways. And having as a team those discussions so that people can say, okay, you know, the task or the challenge for this week is who is best from our team to, to work together and address that. Um, and the, the example that, that came to my mind actually is sort of sparked by Susan's comment earlier. Um, and so it was uh, my, uh, the, the colleague that was working as, as my, my deputy program manager and she her responsibilities usually included sort of leading on running the personnel management of the team and she had this difficult conversation with one of the male members of the team and she said and it so it was her line management responsibility but she said look Chrissy I, I need your help on this one um, because this is somebody from my community and he's a man and I'm a woman and there will be backlash for me just in terms of those the gender power dynamics in that particular community she needed my help uh, and backup um, which you know I had because of the other things that I was bringing as an international in that space but just being able to have open and honest conversations so that different people in the partnership can support each other most effectively to better serve the communities which the whole initiative is, is focused on. I think that getting to that level of honesty and clarity about who brings what and how best to use that is, is really helpful and important. So, and thank you for such interesting discussions today. No, thanks so much, Chrissy. And that's a brilliant example of that, that provocative question. Is it is it the right thing sometimes to use your power? And I think that's a great example with the, the caveat that it's done, you know, carefully, thoughtfully and through real discussion and, and, and mutual uh, awareness. There's one thing I was going to share earlier on. I'll maybe share it now. All keen to be clear, it's, it's not out of any sense criticism of, of, of anyone, not, not least government at all. But it's something that's live in my mind that you know, I was aware 2018, the whole Haiti um, uh, thing with, with safeguarding came out and completely understandable. The Scottish government and the UK government and frankly, every government that funds international development had a really dogmatic approach to safeguarding. And this is this has come out at various points in, in this conversation and really, you know, a, a pretty thinly veiled we're going to cut your funding unless you do this right now to Scottish organisations and then in turn that fed to Malawian organisations. And if I'm completely honest, a couple of years later, it felt like the same thing was happening with a lot of the the stuff around decolonization you know if you're if you're not talking about this if you're not using this language you know we're really going to cut, cut your funding uh, and and a couple of years later again uh, you know feminist led foreign policy again you know being told you know unless you're doing this this is this is you know something we can't we can't support because these are the priorities of of the day and, and each time thinking god each time i then go to counterparts in malawi and say look you know, this is what has to be done. This is now the top issue. And if I'm completely honest, because of the domestic political context in, in the UK, I find that hard to reconcile with a genuinely equitable partnership. And I'm keen to emphasize uh, such that I'm not uh, misunderstood. I'm going to come to you in a sec. Uh, uh, sorry, that was a good by way. Keen to be really clear on this. Uh, I'm not against any of those three things. Safeguarding is hugely important. Decolonization is hugely important. And a feminist led foreign policy is hugely important. And also that it's quite understandable that the government that's democratically elected uh, and is safeguarding those monies is, is setting the priorities. But I think the key thing for me through that journey is recognition of the complexity of it and being honest about how you know money and power does change things. I'm talking too much. I'm going to go to uh, Kevin uh, next. Then any final um, points, please do um, put them in the chat box or put up your hand. Kevin. Over to over to you. Well, this really it's very much to what you've just been saying, David. Um, so we we applied for a grant to a funding organisation there where this year uh, we were successful, um, and then we went into a period of due diligence. And as as part of the due diligence, which was extremely thorough, 
um, they had questions about our equality, diversity and inclusion policy, uh, which they felt didn't reflect current practice in the UK. So could we look at that and resubmit it was what they asked us to do. I happened to be in Malawi in April, so together with the, the team, we looked at this policy together. Um, and it was interesting, some of the things I've, I've just noted down a couple of things that were said here. I'm just going, I'm just going to read what was said. Um, the funders say that they want to listen to black voices, but when they don't like what we say about cultural things, they are not happy. And the word neo-colonialism was used in that context. Uh, do we have to agree on sexuality issues in order to get this funding? And then the other thing that I hadn't noticed, I'd forwarded on the email from the person at the, the funding body um, with the, the request to look at this. And I hadn't realized that on that email, that person had used their, uh, had included their pronouns, which were they, them. Um, so that then followed me attempting to unpack what, why this individual was using they, them pronouns. Um, so the long and the short of all that is, I just went back to the funder, fed back these comments, um, and I'm pleased to say they, uh, we got the funding, uh, and they, and they said they would look again at what they were requiring in the due diligence because they, I think there was a realization perhaps that they were seeking to impose current UK thinking on Malawi. Kevin, that's really, really useful. And I'm, I'm really pleased. If I'm honest, I'm surprised, but I'm really pleased that that was, that was the, the outcome. And I think, you know, it's a shame that we're coming on to this right at the end of the end of the meeting, but, but some of those points around cultural differences and sexuality uh gender identity are you know p potentially at the front line of of some of these conversations um oh she we just had pride pride month um we, we put up a, a piece on our, our website I put a link to it in the, in the chat box really value feedback on that. that that includes some comments and analysis based on conversations we had around the intersection between sort of, you know power and, and some of these some of these things we really value feedback on that we don't have the answers uh, but but it's it's part of a conversation. I'm going to um, I'm going to wrap things up because I, I think with these summer sessions that the, the trick is leaving people thirsty for more. Uh, I'm also not going to do the thing that I sometimes do, which is try and under the guise of a Jerry Springer final thought, just repeat the sort of 30 main points that have been made. I think everyone's heard loud and clear what's 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 been said. It's it's recognizing the complexity. It's 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 the humility and the self awareness. It's the investment in structures and processes, uh, and it's it's relationships with, with human beings first and foremost. I've been scribbling notes right through this. We've got a brilliant video recording, um, and what I'm going to try and do is summarize in sort of a short as possible four paragraphs some of the, the key points from here because i really want to share this with with others of our members perhaps organizations and individuals at the beginning of their relationship with uh with 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 malawi or or, 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 or scotland um I, I think there's so many great nuggets that we've had in this conversation that i really want to think about how do we package those up the people for whom those sharing that sharing that we've had in the last hour has been most useful probably aren't going to sift through our website and watch all past events. So there's a really important technical job of, of trying to get those uh, shareable and findable. So please, if I contact you and say, do you mind if we use your, your wee nugget in this section, please be responsive, uh, please be uh, you know supportive of, of that ask. But I just want to end by saying thanks so much to absolutely everyone that's fed in. Sometimes you go away from these meetings and think, mm, I didn't have a chance to say this, or, or you think of it afterwards, just email your input. Um, but also there'll be overlap in our, in our next two sessions. Uh, in July, we are meeting on the 19th of July um, to discuss sustainability. Easy to say, hard to achieve. On the 16th of August, we're going to meet um, for our final in this session on digital inclusivity. Is there equality, uh, uh, equitable access in the new digital world? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your challenges uh, as, as well. And let's keep the, the conversation going. Have a great day, everyone.